Thank you. Uh, it's, it, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work that Paul alluded to in that last talk. Uh, this is our work on investment incentives and near optimal mechanisms, uh, which is joined also with Mohammed Akbapur and Scott Commoners. Uh, so this starts from a really basic question in economics, right? We've got a, which is how should we allocate resources and set prices, right? We've got some, you know, constrained set of resources we want to allocate to people who should get what and how much should they pay? And there's a, um, you know, there's a clean classical answer to this that sometimes works, which is we should use a Vickery Clark Groves mechanism. That's to say, you know, we, well, actually for this audience, we all know what this mechanism is, uh, but it's got maybe three cardinal virtues. It's a, a strategy proof mechanism. It's a dominant strategy to report your value truthfully. Uh, it yields sort of definitionally, it yields efficient allocations, right? We're choosing whichever allocation of resources maximizes social welfare. And uh, it, an and equally fundamental, but less well appreciated feature of this is that it yields efficient investment incentives in a precise sense. So the thought is, imagine that we are, you know, there are multiple bidders with different values for a good. Suppose I change just one bidder's value. So Im Im imagine this is like a bidder is able to increase his value for the good uh, by making some complementary investment that is potentially costly. Now, uh, under the VCG mechanism, the change in that bidder's payoff is exactly equal to the change in social welfare. So it will turn out that the bidder will make this investment, will change his value, if and only if doing so would maximize social welfare net of investment costs. Now, this is not an original observation to us. This goes back at least as far as Rogerson 92, and it appears, uh, a related observation appears in an incomplete information world uh, in Dirk's paper with Yusuf Valimaki uh, in 2002. Now, there are some important caveats to this observation about efficient investment incentives. Um, the first is that uh, to be able to invest efficiently, the bidder has to know his prices, right? He needs to know ahead of time what price he's going to pay for the resource. Otherwise, he might make an investment that makes the resource more valuable, but it might turn out the price okay, is too so high and he doesn't right get now, it. So he's started. So I, I have to, uh, so I want to take a minute now. So I'm going to have to do that. So, so. Um, Hi, Bob. No worries. Uh, cool. So, you know, that. that Another important caveat is, of course, if you have multiple investors, it turns out coordination issues can arise. Uh, it can be that there are good equilibria and bad equilibria with investment under the VCG mechanism. Uh, and the third thing, which is really the focus of this talk, is that VCG mechanisms rely very sensitively on exact optimization. They require us to be able to find, uh, that's to say, whoever's running the mechanism has to be able to compute the exactly optimal allocation and it turns out that if you're wrong even a little bit, that can undermine the properties of the mechanism in a big way. So why is this a problem? Well, many real world allocation problems are NP hard. It's computationally hard for the auctioneer to compute the optimal allocation. You saw an example of this in Paul's talk uh, for the FCC incentive auction. Spectrum auctions with local interference constraints can be such that it's NP hard to compute the value maximizing allocation. It's well known in combinatorial auctions, even under complete information, even if you know every bidder's value for the different bundles, it's NP hard to compute uh, the value maximizing allocation of bundles to bidders. And there are a variety of integer packing problems where you have to either, you know, allocate someone the good or not. So there's a non-convexity uh, where it's also going to be NP hard to figure out who you should give the good. So in practice, faced with situations like this, we don't compute the exact optimum. We have to use various kinds of approximate allocation rules. Um, and our research question is essentially this. Suppose we take one of these approximate allocation rules and we use it in a strategy-proof mechanism. So we find associated prices that make that allocation rule strategy-proof. Uh, what happens to the incentives bidders have to invest efficiently in the relevant resources? So, you know, uh, if you'll excuse a little bit of history for this paper, this really comes out from a provocative chapter in Paul's book, Discovering Prices, uh, where he observes that if you're running 
uh, a, a kind of uniform price auction using a greedy algorithm for a certain kind of packing problem, then that can create weird investment incentives where bidders make investments even though you wouldn't want them to make. Uh, and uh, you know, we were having a talk about this in, in Broadsheet Coffee in Cambridge, uh, and that basically became this paper. So let me fix ideas. Let me show you one specific instance before writing down a general model. So we're thinking of a knapsack problem. What's a knapsack problem? Well, there's a set of bidders, right? Think of them, each bidder has a certain value for being put in the knapsack. And each bidder has a size, which is the amount of space they take in the knapsack. And there's a capacity for the knapsack. In this case, the knapsack can fit 20 units worth of bidder. Um, now, the knapsack problem is NP hard, right? There's no known polytime algorithm that always outputs optimal allocations. So what we could do is we could run a greedy algorithm, right? So this is Danzig's greedy algorithm. Uh, what we do is we take the bidders and we sort them by their value divided by their size in descending order. So this big bidder, the guy with uh, value six and size 12, right? He has the lowest value per unit size. So he goes to the end of the line. What do we do next? Well, we pack the bidders from left to right, just putting them in a knapsack so long as they fit. So we pack the first bidder, value 10, size 10, pack the second bidder, value 10, size 10. Eventually, the next bidder doesn't fit, at which point we stop, right? So that's a simple heuristic algorithm that we might use uh, for a computationally hard problem. Now it's natural to say, okay, that's well and good, uh, but this approach assumed that we knew what the bidder's values were. Right? It assumed that we, we had those values as inputs to the algorithm. So it turns out that's not a big problem. What we can do is we can run a strategy proof mechanism. We'll ask the bidders to report their values. We'll run the greedy algorithm on the reported values and we will charge each packed bidder his threshold price. So the threshold price is the lowest price, the lowest value that bidder could report while still being packed under the algorithm. So in order for the little bidders to be packed, they need to come first or second in line, right? So they need a value over unit size of at least 0.5. So their threshold price, the lowest value they could report to be packed is five. The big bidder who's not packed, well, in order to be packed, he would need to come first. That requires a value over size of one. So his threshold price is 12, right? So we've taken this greedy heuristic algorithm, and we've turned it into a strategy proof mechanism with this trick. Now, I want to note something uh, weird that's going on here, which is that when we run this kind of auction, there are profitable, privately profitable investments that can be bad for social welfare. So the big bidder was not packed and has zero utility. Let's imagine that the big bidder uh, can invest to raise his value to 14 at a cost of one. So he's making some complementary investment that increases his benefit for being in the knapsack. Now, his threshold price is 12. So if he raises his value to 14, he's going to be packed. He's going to pay his threshold price of 12. He's going to pay a cost of one. And that's positive, right? So it's worthwhile. It's privately profitable to make this investment. On the other hand, Notice what happens when he makes this investment, the greedy algorithm sorts him to the front of the line, packs him, and then it stops. So the investment has reduced welfare. Originally, our welfare was 20, right? We got 10 from each little bidder. Now we're getting a welfare of 14 minus an investment cost of one. So a total welfare of 13. So this was a privately profitable investment in a strategy proof mechanism and it turned out to be pretty bad for social welfare. Now, what's going on? Like, why didn't the VCG analysis work here? Well, the key intuition is this. If you have an exactly optimal allocation algorithm, then the threshold prices in that algorithm eliminate all the externalities. They make it such that the change in a bidder's payoff from changing her value is equal to the change in social welfare. It turns out that this property is pretty fragile. Exact optimization is essentially necessary for this property to happen. Uh, and, and I'm not going to get into exactly how that's true, but you can see it's proposition 2.3 in this paper. Uh, if you don't have an exactly optimizing algorithm, basically this nice pricing the externality property 
uh, isn't going to hold in the corresponding strategy proof mechanism. So if you're going to use a different allocation algorithm, uh, an, an approximate allocation algorithm, conceptually speaking, what's going to happen is there are going to be certain effects on the other bidder's welfare that are not priced for the bidder in question. So there are going to be two kinds of externalities that we might think about. The first is that if I'm using an approximation algorithm like the greedy algorithm, it might be that the bidder's threshold price is not equal to the social cost of packing him. Right, so that's what happened just now, right? The social cost of packing the big bidder was 20, right? Because that's what we would have done otherwise if the big bidder wasn't there. But the threshold price of the big bidder was 14. So his threshold price was not aligned with the cost of packing him. Now, there's a different kind of externality you might think ar might arise, which is that sometimes in an approximation algorithm, I might change a bidder's value in a way that doesn't affect whether or not he's packed. But changing the value can affect the quality of the approximation. It can affect who else is packed. So this is kind of a bossy externality, right? Certain value changes that don't change your own allocation can affect someone else's allocation. And because you're not crossing a threshold, those changes aren't priced. So those two are going to be externalities that affect other bidders. Now, it turns out that in a sense, we will make precise, not all of these externalities are going to harm the algorithm's approximation. Only some of these externalities are going to lead to bad performance under investment, and I'm going to tell you which these are. So having seen that specific case, let me move to a slightly more general model. Uh, the model primitives involve these things. These things are allocation instances. They specify for some set of bidders n, a value profile. So each bidder has a value for being packed. We can generalize that to multidimensional types, but you know, see the paper if you're interested. And a set of feasible allocations, which are a subset of the power set of the bidders. They say which bidders will fit in the knapsack simultaneously. So an instance tells me each bidder's value for being packed and which bidders I can pack at the same time. An allocation problem omega is just a collection of these instances. So the, the, you know, the knapsack problem is an example, right? Like it's all of the instances that involve these kinds of constraints where bidders have sizes and I've got a total capacity for the knapsack. We're going to assume that for all sets of feasible allocations, the value profiles that are in the allocation problem are a product of closed intervals. And this is just because uh, we like using the envelope theorem, as you might expect, and this makes it easy. Uh, an allocation rule, which we'll call an algorithm, is going to choose a feasible allocation for each instance. So it'll take as an input an instance, and it's going to give us as an output some feasible allocation, where I'm going to use this x n, this x subscript n, to be a 0, 1 indicator, which is equal to 1 if bidder n is packed. A payment rule just tells me how much each bidder pays, right? So it's a thing in Rn. And a mechanism just consists of an algorithm and a payment rule, right? So, so far, this is pretty standard. Now, again, this is also pretty standard. Uh, suppose I have some arbitrary algorithm, and I want to use, make this into a strategy-proof mechanism. This up here is the usual definition of strategy proofness. It says for every instance and for all bidders, uh, it's optimal for that bidder to report their true value. And this is, uh, again, a familiar condition, mo monotonicity. An algorithm is monotone if for any bidder n, there exists a packing threshold where that threshold is a function that doesn't depend on n's value, such that if bidder n has a value strictly above that threshold, she's packed. And if it's strictly below, she's not packed. Now, if I have a monotone algorithm, it's pretty easy to make it into a strategy-proof mechanism. All I do is I charge the threshold price. I charge each bidder a price equal to her packing threshold. And this result, I mean, really, you can see versions of this result in Meyerson 81. Uh, but you know, this result says that this is an even-only of condition. So there exists some payment rule such that the algorithm paired with that payment rule is strategy-proof if and only if the allocation algorithm is monotone. So I'm going to restrict attention to monotone algorithms. Those are the ones that we can turn into mechanisms. 
Now, it turns out we can simplify the analysis even further um, because the strategy proof payment rule is essentially unique. So this is, again, just a consequence of the envelope theorem. Uh, if an algorithm is strategy, if, if a mechanism is strategy proof, then there exist functions, each of which don't depend on a bidder's own value, such that the price the bidder pays is equal to an indicator for whether they are packed, multiplied by their packing threshold, plus this strategically irrelevant term. Right, so this is really neat, because what this says is that if, if you give me any two strategy proof mechanisms that use the same allocation algorithm, then your net return on investment, right? When you change your value, how much does your utility change? It's going to be exactly the same in both. So for any strategy proof mechanism consisting of an algorithm and a payment rule, the algorithm alone is going to be sufficient for us to analyze the investment incentives. So we've reduced this problem from thinking about mechanisms, strategy proof mechanisms to a problem of just thinking about which algorithms lead to good investment incentives. Now, of course, um, when exact optimization is infeasible, it's not like we throw up our hands. Uh, instead, we approximate. And there's a vast computer science literature that studies fast algorithms for hard allocation problems. Now, this is a, a part of computational complexity theory. So of course, to play nice with the other fundamental parts of complexity theory, it uses worst case guarantees, right? Rather than thinking of a, a prior on all the knapsack instances we might encounter, instead, uh, we say, uh, what is the bound that we can have across every knapsack instance, right? It requires this kind of worst case robustness. And so this is how those kinds of approximations are usually stated. So I'm going to denote the welfare achieved by some allocation algorithm X. This is W of X at this instance. That's just the sum of the packed bidders for those bidders' values, right? This is the total value of the bidders we managed to pack. And we're going to say for some beta in 0, 1, that an algorithm acts as a beta approximation if for every instance of the problem, the welfare it achieves is at least beta times the welfare under the efficient allocation, right? So this is a multiplicative guarantee. We're always getting a, a fraction beta uh, of what we could, you know, of, of the first best. And if your algorithm is good, hopefully beta is close to 1. So for instance, uh, I've showed you the greedy algorithm for the knapsack problem. It turns out that a small modification of that algorithm gives us a non-trivial guarantee. The smart greedy algorithm just computes the output of the greedy algorithm and compares that to the, out, the, the algorithm, com compares that to what it could get by packing the single bidder with the highest value. And it does whichever is better. Now it turns out that this simple modification, this smart greedy algorithm, is a half approximation for the knapsack problem. That's to say for every knapsack instance, it gets us within at least a half of the first best. Now, okay, having set that up, here's the question. Suppose we start with some monotone algorithm and run the corresponding strategy proof mechanism. Now we know that if we have an efficient, efficient allocation algorithm, and it's strategy proof, then it's a Vickery algorithm, then, then, then it's a VCG mechanism, right? The, the mechanism is VCG, so it's going to lead to efficient investments. Now, our question is, is it true that if you have an approximately efficient allocation algorithm in a strategy proof mechanism, it's going to lead to approximately efficient investments? And it turns out, unfortunately, the answer is no in general. So you can be, in fact, arbitrarily close optimal in the allocation space and be arbitrarily far from optimal when even a single bidder has an opportunity to invest. So I'm going to have to explain that a little bit. Here's the thought. We're going to measure net welfare in the mechanism, including investment. So we're going to suppose that some bidder is going to choose either to get some value V upper bar at some cost C upper bar or get some value V lower bar at a cost which we're gonna to normalize to zero. So you're gonna make an investment. Think of this like there's some complementary action that is useful only if you're being packed. And so this, an investment technology tells me these things, right? What's the value I can get if I make the investment and what's the value I have if I don't? 
And the thought is that given some investment technology and his threshold price, so here the bidder knows his threshold price, the bidder chooses an investment to maximize his payoff under the corresponding strategy proof mechanism. And it doesn't matter which strategy proof mechanism, they're all gonna lead to the same investments. So B star are just the arg max with respect to the investments of that bidder's utility, right? He's choosing whichever thing, he's either gonna get value V upper bar at cost C upper bar or value V lower bar at cost zero. And so I'm gonna measure welfare uh, in the algorithm, including investments. So here, give me an investment technology, values for the other bidders and a set of feasible allocations. I'm gonna look at the worst case across investments that are best responses for bidder N of the allocated welfare net of the cost. And I've got to pick a benchmark to compare this to. We're going to pick a, you know, a, a sort of fairly demanding benchmark. Our benchmark is we're going to have efficient investments and efficient allocations. So this W bar star, this is the first best including investment. So what are we doing? We're computing the efficient allocation for each VN that we might have, and we're maximizing over the different investments. So we're picking the first best investment assuming that once we've made the investment, we're gonna pick the first best allocation. And I'm gonna say that an algorithm is a beta approximation with investment if for any investment instance. So an investment instance specifies an investment technology for one bidder, values for the other bidders and feasible allocations. We have that the welfare achieved by the algorithm is at least beta times the welfare achieved under the first best. Now notice, this is going to allow some inefficient investments, right? We're not requiring that every investment is good for social welfare. We're just asking that welfare net of investment costs is at least some ratio of the first best. Now, when I'm broadening the model slightly in this way, how is that going to affect the guarantees of the approximation algorithm, right? So the thought is that a clever computer scientist is hopefully you know, made progress on the allocation problem we're thinking about. They've handed us an approximation algorithm. It's nice and monotone, so we can use it for a mechanism. Now we want to know if a bidder can invest, is it still going to do okay? Now it turns out that when I add these investments, uh, the guarantees can't get any better, right? So for any beta, uh, if the algorithm is not a beta approximation just for simple allocations, then the algorithm is not a beta approximation with investment. Why is that? Well, you can think of trivial instances, right? Where V upper bar and V lower bar are the same, so it doesn't matter whether the investment gets made. So you can't, they, 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 this ratio can't get any better. It turns out it can get a lot worse. To be precise, for all beta less than one, so that's for all beta strictly less than one, that's to say for any algorithm that isn't exactly optimal, so for, for any approximation ratio that isn't you know, completely optimal, there exists an algorithm, there exists a beta approximation for the knapsack problem that is no more than a zero approximation with investment. It has no meaningful guarantee when investments are added. Now that's not to say that every algorithm is bad. What this proposition is saying is that closeness to optimality isn't by itself enough to guarantee closeness to optimality with investment. Now, why is that so? Let me give you an example of what goes wrong. This is a satisficing algorithm. If bitter one's value exceeds 99% of the total, pack her only. Otherwise, optimize exactly. Now, this algorithm, you know, it, it, it stops when it gets pretty close. So suppose there are two bidders and we can fit both in the knapsack. What does this algorithm do? Well, it packs just bitter one if one's value is at least 0.99 of the total, and it packs both bidders otherwise. Now, bidder one is always going to be packed in instances like these, so her threshold price is zero. Suppose she can either have a value of zero at a cost of zero, or a value of k plus epsilon at a cost of k. Now, for a positive epsilon, it's profitable to invest. And if I make k large enough, then only bidder one's going to be packed. She's going to be at least 0.99 of the total. What's the welfare when she makes the investment? Well, it's K plus Epsilon minus the cost of the investment K, which is Epsilon. What's the first best? 
The first best is to make the investment and pack both bidders. So you'll get V2 plus epsilon. That means that the approximation ratio we get is no more than epsilon over V2 plus epsilon. Of course, you can make epsilon as small as you like. This shows that in general, this algorithm, despite being within 0.99 of the optimum, is no more than a zero approximation with investment. Now, what goes wrong here? The, the thing that goes wrong is that this algorithm has a bossy negative externality. Raising bitter one's value from zero to k plus epsilon doesn't change whether bitter one is packed, but it reduces the welfare of bitter two. And I mentioned this is an example I've chosen for ease of exposition, but there are real algorithms that have this vulnerability. So there's, there's a canonical fully polynomial time approximation scheme for the knapsack problem. You'll find it in you know, all of the algorithms textbooks. It has the same vulnerability as the algorithm I just showed you. So it's natural to ask, okay, so which algorithms have guarantees that are robust to investment? When is it that if you're close to optimal before we have investments, you remain close to optimal after investments? And it turns out this is the important condition, right? The condition is, is this, it says in words, if I start from some instance and look at what the algorithm would do, if I raise the value of a packed bidder or I lower the value of an unpacked bidder, and then I run the algorithm again, then the welfare of the other bidders does not fall. So we call this excludes bossy negative externalities because it's saying, look, I'm taking a bidder who's being packed. I'm raising his value. It's a monotone algorithm, so it doesn't affect what he gets. But if he, if doing this causes harm to other bidders, that's a bossy negative externality. Similarly, if I lower the value of an unpacked bidder and it harms other bidders, that's a bossy negative externality. It says the total value of the other bidders before we make the change has to be no more than the total value after we make the change. And the key theorem of the paper says, for any beta, if the algorithm excludes bossy negative externalities and there's a beta approximation, then it's a beta approximation with investment. So let me give you some examples of these. If you give me an exactly optimal algorithm, it's AXPOM. The greedy algorithm I showed you is AXPOM. The max of any set of Axbone algorithms is itself Axbone. So the smart greedy algorithm is Axbone. Why? It's the max of the greedy algorithm, the algorithm that packs the first bit of for sure, the algorithm that packs the second bit of for sure, and so on and so on and so on. In fact, any non-bossy monotone algorithm is Axbone, where non-bossy means that if we change a bidder's value without changing whether he's packed, then the allocation is not changed. So this includes, for instance, certain kinds of greedy rejection algorithms that were used for the 2017 FCC reverse auction. Now, um, it would be ambitious to do the proof, uh, but given that, the, you know, the, 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 the key thought for the intuition is this. Uh, Especially threshold the time prices, constraints, yes. Yes, given the time constraints. <laughs> so the, the key intuition is this, right? Uh, the threshold prices may not reflect the social cost of packing a bidder, but in some sense, that misalignment is already integrated in the algorithm's original allocative guarantee. That's to say, if there's an investment that moves a value to just cross a threshold at a tiny cost, then there's an instance of the allocation problem with an equally bad performance. And so that was already reflected in the original beta for the allocation problem. So investments reduce worst case welfare by value changes that don't cross the packing threshold. These are the unpriced changes, the bossy externalities. And Axbone forbids harm to other bidders from exactly those changes. Now, that's the proof up for a moment. You can pause it if you're watching this on video later. Um, there's a sense in which this is necessary and sufficient, um, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. You can define a slightly weaker condition, weakly Axbone, and you can show that that essentially characterizes the cases where investment approx where, where simple allocative approximations also persist when investment opportunities are added. Um, you can extend this in a bunch of ways. You can extend it to cost minimization problems, to multidimensional type spaces, to combinatorial auctions. See the paper if you're interested in any of these. But the big message that we have from this is that it turns out that being just nearly optimal in terms of allocations is not enough to be optimal when simple investment opportunities are added. 
But the danger comes not from all the externalities, not from threshold and bossy externalities, but only from these bossy negative externalities. And if the algorithm has this property, which is not too, too hard to verify, then you know that the investments aren't going to mess you up. Um, some textbook approximations have this nice property, others do not. Uh, so it's something that is neither so impossible you could never get it, nor so possible that you get it even by chance. Cool. Okay. And uh, I don't want to steal Susan's time. Uh, so that's a wrap.